Retro. Yeah. Electro. Uh. Tech. Hey, turn the lights back on. Wow. Retro Electro Tech. When real audio ruled the world. Well, hello there once again. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Retro Ernest of Retro Electro Tech. And I have here another Pioneer model SX1010. I had one a few months or so back that came to me with a right channel complaint. And this one here also has come to me with a channel complaint. I'm not sure what channel yet. Uh, I don't recall if the customer mentioned that to me. It's been a few months or so. But regardless though, um, I'm about to perform a safe power up, get that underway, and then get a signal into it and uh, examine the channels and see what we have. The last SX1010 that I had on the bench, some of you might remember, that one came in with a right channel complaint. And we saw on that one, when I uh, was monitoring the channels on the oscilloscope, we had some intermittent behavior on the right channel. It was getting jittery, jumpy, and then it would drop out completely, then it would come back and what have you. So on that unit, once I got into it and started uh, trying to gain access you know, to the amplifier boards and heat sinks and uh, get to what I had to get to to perform some diagnostics, which I did, um, it turned out that I regained my, uh, my channel, that right channel, and it never dropped out again. Um, and that was after I moved around the amp board, manipulated the wires around when I was moving the board and all that. So it turned out that there was in fact some funky looking solder joints, not only on the right amp board, but on the other board as well. I went through, did quite a bit of uh, reflowing of solder joints, uh, really check connections, to the best of my ability based on the time, the budget that I had to work on it. And I did such things, my due diligence as far as going through and refurbishing the amp boards, getting old electrolytic capacitors out of there, going through and checking tolerances of other components, making sure that um, you know I remove anything that's out of tolerance. And, and I did that. Uh, same thing with removing some uh, transistors that are known to be problematic transistors now that they are as old as they are, I got those out. So I did more than just reflow solder joints on those amp boards. I went through and refurbished the amplifier boards and redid the power supply, all that, because that was getting blazing hot as well. And it was pretty discolored, pretty common with these, uh, you know, these receivers. So anyways, uh, moral of the story is that, that will, that's what was going on on that last SX1010. On this one, again, as I said, I haven't even performed a safe power up. I'm gonna do that, like I said, get a signal in it, start checking uh, both channels, see what's going on when I uh, work through the various controls. There's a lot of push button switches and pots and all that. There could be something going on there, which is pretty common, that could um, you know, mimic that type of behavior a bad, bad amplifier channel, you know, cutting in and out, getting noisy, intermittent, all that. So we might have something in the controls or we might have a, a bad, you know, failed or failing component somewhere else, a connection issue, who knows? So that's what we're gonna find out. And um, I'm just gonna go through and see what there is to see there. And uh, after that, I'm just gonna get with the customer and let the customer know what it is that I found. And, uh, you know, pretty much what it looks like he's gonna be in for as far as um, you know, where I'm gonna need to go to gain access, if I'm gonna have to pull the amp section out, start uh, sussing through that, diagnosing problems, or you know, we might dodge a bullet and it might just be the controls go in there and get all the controls serviced, although that's a bit of work because there's a lot of controls that need to be thoroughly serviced on these old units. You know, this is what, mid 70s? Um, so yeah, it's, it's an old unit and if it, has, it hasn't had any service on any of the controls, uh, that could be an issue there, but these things have a tendency to get uh, a buildup of you know dust and debris that works its way in and degraded lubricants, things like that that cause problems. But we'll get in there and when I pop the top, I'll go through and do my cursory inspection of the inside too, both the top side and the, and the, and the underside, the bottom side to see 
what there is to see, make sure everything looks okay, that there's no red flags, that all the components look okay, and uh, nothing that really pops out. But I'll get into that in a moment. First, let me go in, get this thing on the uh, current limiter on the dim bulb tester, perform a safe power up, and then we will go from there. So let's get to it. Okay, let's get into this thing and see what there is to see. Okay, here we are looking down into the top side at a little bit of a funny angle, but you can still see in here and you get the point as to what's going on. And even though I'm not going to be zooming in up close and panning around and really, really covering uh, the detail on camera, I can say that everything looks uh, normal in here. I don't see anything, you know, out of the ordinary as far as anything that looks overheated or cracked. Um, yeah, all the components look normal, okay, the way they're supposed to look. The electrolytics, the um, resistors, and uh, diodes, and transistors, the ones that I can visualize pretty well. Yeah, everything looks good. I don't see anything that really stands out and looks overheated or you know discolored or anything like that cracked or that's just sitting there uh, looking bad so I would say that at least in this area so far everything is looking pretty good these reservoir caps look good transformer uh, the wiring that I can see looks pretty good down in here as well I'm gonna move some some things out of the way as I get into it further if I end up going further if the customer wants me to to move on I'll get these uh, covers out of the way in just a bit. Just take a quick look underneath and make sure that nothing looks um, damaged or otherwise defective or whatever the case. But just right off the bat, I wanted to, to look in here and see if anything um, you know, is, is looking rough and throwing me some warning signs. But everything looks okay on this side. If everything looks okay on the bottom side, then we'll go ahead and give her a uh, safe power up and go from there. Okay, so we are here on the bottom side, and I'll scroll up and down real quick, kind of see what we got going on here. Everything actually looks fairly clean under here. Nothing looks damaged. You know, we have our, you know, some, some of the uh, control boards and switch boards and uh, power supply and, you know, the bottom of the reservoir caps and transformer and all that so there you go let me let me lock on right there okay so I'll talk about the power supply a little bit on the last unit I pointed out how um, overheated the power supply was getting and that's pretty common with some of these so I am going to recommend that the power supply is uh, refurbished and emphasis is put there because of the fact that while well, the power supply as I always say is the heartbeat of the unit if you have an unreliable power supply then you know you can only expect problems so there you go um, I will briefly I'm not going to zoom in too close because things get kind of blurry but let me see what I can do here at least good enough okay so you can see uh, these cap cans here. You can see the labels that are uh, retracted. They're retracting down. You know, this one's very retracted. Same with this. Um, heat will cause these labels to, you know, retract, to shrink. So you can tell that these caps have been getting hot. And last time, yeah, I just pulled all of them out. And I had to replace some uh, uh, past transistors as well that were bad a couple of them I think were opened up and yeah I'll go through and I'll check all of the uh, component values make sure everything is uh, within spec within tolerance and just give, give everything a once over the back of the board as far as um, you know this board gets really hot so I'm gonna want to check solder joints and see what I'm gonna have to end up reflowing I had to do quite a bit of reflowing on the last board the solder joints were not so good and I'll do that on any uh, areas that you know, I have access to the solder joints. I'll go over with, as I always say, 
with my my magnifier my light I'll get in here and I will check out the boards and touch up anything that needs it reflow anything that needs it as a matter of course I always do that and I try to hit it the best that I can with you know again just uh, the time that I have to devote to that and as I'm working through here I'll go back and forth and make sure I got everything that I didn't leave anything that should have been um, you know attended to so everything's looking okay back here at least good enough to power up and that's what I want to do and then you know I'll go back eventually and I'll talk with the customer once I get this evaluation all done let them know about the power supply it would be a good idea the amplifier boards as well you know the amplifier boards on the other one and you know on all these old pieces of equipment these amps and receivers uh, the areas that are subjected to more electrical wear and tear you know again power supply the amp boards and all that uh, should be given consideration as far as um, do I need to go in there and get those old caps out of there that's usually a good idea both for the sake of uh, bringing up the reliability factor but also uh, potentially improving the fidelity the audio quality of the of the unit and um, you know it depends on the component uh, what its job is where it lies in terms of if it's in the signal path and all that and what effect it has on you know the sonic performance overall but uh, these are all things to consider amplifier boards power supply go in there uh, start starting there is a good point in you know getting a unit up and running getting it uh, a bit more reliable and where it should be uh, the areas that again have more electrical wear and tear power supply amplifier boards get those all squared away on the other ones you know I replaced some transistors that were uh, known to be problematic as they've gotten older and then I you know replaced some out of tolerance components and some old caps and all that so I went through and did my due diligence once again on the amplifier boards touched up solder joints as well there's quite a few solder joints that really needed attention so that's all common work in here that's why I'm gonna bring it up but if I could just go in here and assess the problem uh, the problem on the channel fix that by going in sussing out the problem replacing a bad component or two or whatever and get the channel working again according to what the customer has brought to my attention we'll find out if that's the case as I go through and safe power up get a signal in it and all that or if it's just maybe uh, bad controls or funky controls that are causing intermittent behavior or you know a channel to drop out or whatever so that's where I am right now so everything's looking good down here so let's go ahead and get this uh, flip back around again I'll get a signal in it so forth well you know I'll start the safe power up first make sure everything's gonna go okay there we'll get a signal in it and see what we have on the uh, right and the left channel and see if the uh, customers complaint is in fact uh, you know well founded if there is in fact a, a channel problem and what it's going to take to get that done so let's go ahead and get into it and here we are at the back of the receiver we have all of our jacks everything is looking pretty good pretty clean back here I don't see any problems so I just wanted to uh, show this for the record back here and also let me um, let me check the fuse make sure we have the correct fuse in here and yeah we have a 6 amp uh, fuse it's intact so that's good so great no open fuse blown fuse whatever and it's the uh, correct value so that's fine everything's looking good back here so let's uh, let's get into the power up okay so I'm getting ready to perform a safe power up using this current limiter device here this box that has three light bulbs three switches on the side you plug in the device under test which is your receiver here and with the uh, help of the bulb filaments and the resistance provided by the bulb filaments depending on the size of the bulb meaning the wattage of the bulb is going to dictate how much current is allowed to be utilized by this device under test so initially I'm starving it pretty uh, stiffly of current so that if this thing is going to fail um, it's not going to have very much current whatsoever to do so so I often use that forest fire analogy that in order for a forest fire to become a successful forest fire 
and grow, spread, and all that. It needs fuel for that, materials, oxygen, you know, whatever. And same thing with a uh, piece of equipment that's going to fail catastrophically and try to, you know, short out and let out the smoke and make big scary noises. In order to do that, it, it draws heavy current. It needs to draw on heavy current. It needs that fuel. And this device here, like I said, it starves this device of that fuel in a controlled manner. Uh, you know, I'm doing this in a controlled manner. I'm selecting how much current limiting I want to protect this. And if it looks like it's doing okay, then I'll let it have a little more current and a little more until finally it proves itself that it's going to behave. So that's ultimately what I'm doing here. I'm not letting a forest fire happen and let something go out of control if I can avoid it. And uh, this should always be done even if a piece of equipment is uh, expected to work just fine because it's in regular use. Safe power up. Got to do it. So um, that's what I'm doing here. So the small little bulb off to, uh, you know, all the way over to the left over here is a bulb that I'm going to kick in. It's the smallest bulb, so it's going to uh, perform the most current limiting. It's going to glow the brightest initially. It might only go down a little bit in brightness, but normally what should happen, hence the reason why it's referred to as a dim bulb tester as well, whatever bulb you're using, it should come up bright initially when the capacitors in there, the filter caps, the main reservoir caps and all that are coming up to charge. That goes up bright, the bulb, and then it should come down. Depending on the size of the bulb, and how much current limiting is taking place is, is going to kind of dictate how far the bulb comes down in luminance and sits there dim. Uh, the smaller bulb is going to stay there kind of bright, but it st should still go down. And I'm going to eventually use a bigger bulb till I, you know, feel confident enough that despite the fact that I'm giving it a little bit more current by giving it, you know, a, a larger bulb by uh, kicking in a, a larger bulb by giving it a little bit more current. I feel confident that it's behaving itself if I'm going to even do that. So if all looks good in the beginning, then I will gradually, uh, you know, let it off the current limiter and go from there. But for now, let's go ahead and I'm just going to pull in this. Uh, uh, actually, yeah, I already have the bulb kicked in. Let me go ahead and turn on the device under test. Here it goes and watch that bulb. Okay, it dimmed down just a little bit, but I don't hear the protection relay coming in. So uh, when these devices, receivers, amps are starved of current, uh, depending on how starved they are, is going to dictate whether or not the uh, protection relay comes in, you hear that click. So let me go ahead and I'm going to bring in a bulb that's a little bit, uh, a little bit uh, bigger will uh, allow a little bit more current to the device under test and we should hear that device uh, click in eventually the um, uh, the relay that is okay so let me go ahead and turn this uh, bulb off and then I'll bring in one that's a little bit bigger so let me go ahead and do that okay and I heard the relay just click in I don't know if you heard that but um, yeah, looking good, looking good. And again, the the luminance of the bulb, that's one thing that I, you know, I'm gonna always wanna watch. I wanna make sure that it's not starting to kind of flicker or kind of surge a bit, you know, indicating that maybe this uh, device under test is trying to draw heavier current for whatever reason. So that should stay stable like that. And eventually, uh, when I get down to, you know, a lower, or excuse me, a larger wattage of bulb. I'm using a 100 watt bulb there. You can see it's it's glowing pretty dim, all right? And of course the relay kicked in and you can see that I'm letting in enough current now to light up the, the display. You can see the dial pointer there and whatnot. So I am going to leave it sitting on the current limiter for a little while, okay, and just make sure that it's going to stay there and uh, behave nice and uh, stable, and yeah, if it does that, then we're good. So let me let it sit here for a little while, then I will be back when I get um, the signal put in it, and I'm just going to feed a signal 
from the function generator around back to the auxiliary input, probably a one kilohertz tone, and we'll go ahead and look at the uh, uh, we'll go ahead and look at the oscilloscope there and see what we have. Make sure we have both channels or not. So there's our function generator that's going to feed into the into the uh, auxiliary input here of our device under test. So nothing to it. And then I could start going around and manipulating these controls and see what we get on the uh, scope. You know, I'm, I'm hoping it's in the controls. That'll be nice. But again, uh, we'll see. So I'm going to leave it sitting on the current limiter for a while, and then I'll be back in just, uh, just a moment. Okay, and here we are looking at both channels. We're looking at the yellow trace, which is the left channel, the blue trace, the right channel, of course. You can see some diminishment in the left channel yellow signal compared to the right. Now the right channel was worse initially when I first powered it on and I started playing with the controls got the right channel the blue trace to kind of bounce back a little it was intermittent and kind of kind of pulsing around and you know just acting a bit jittery but again as you can see it's back the left channel appears to be the one that's a bit more diminished both channels look a little jittery there. You can see them every once in a while getting jittery and you know the waveforms kind of kind of get a bit jumpy and unstable. Okay. What I think is going on with these channels, I think in part, I think some of it has to do with these controls. Now the con controls definitely have some influence early on, but what you see there is as good as it's getting now. Uh, no matter what I do with the controls now, they're not getting any better. And I'll demonstrate that just briefly. I'm going to go through starting with the base, uh, you know, the base control or controls. And you can see, uh, probably because I've worked on these controls a little bit, I got some of the ugliness out of them. Okay, here's our treble. Yeah. Tape monitors, and they're a little bit noisy. You could you could see the the static in these controls, but again, you know, there's nothing here that I see that's really really affecting the uh, amplitude of the channels there. Okay, so I'm gonna play around with the volume here, just exercise it a little bit. Okay. So, you know, not bad. Not bad uh, considering where I thought I might be with just a dead channel entirely. Now, let's go ahead real quick and take a look at the uh, right and left channel, but we're just going to look at the pre-out. That's it. We're, we're going to remove the, uh, the main amp from the equation and just take a look at the, uh, the pre-out and see if things are looking a little bit better in terms of the, uh, the symmetry. Okay, and here's our preamp out. Okay, so we're, again, we're removing the uh, the main amp from the equation and just looking at the pre the preamp out. Okay, so let me go ahead and bring it up. You can see that what I have here is both channels, right and left, stacked on top of each other. Okay, so we can get a better representation of the asymmetry between the two. Okay, and not bad at all. There's a little bit as you kind of climb in amplitude, but not much. Not much at all. Looking pretty good on the um, on the preamp out. Okay, as opposed to the the main amp, that main amp board. Um, when we're looking at the uh, outputs, scoping the outputs, we see the asymmetry there. And so, um, anyways, let me go ahead and change views. Okay, and we are looking at the main amplifier section, the main amp board, amplifier out, whatever. Um, and right now, things are not looking too shabby. Both waveforms, which are uh, currently stacked on top of each other, are fairly symmetrical, but that wasn't the case a moment ago. There was some asymmetry between the two channels, 
uh, it seemed like the right channel was much more diminished than the left this time around. Last time it was the other way around. So when it comes to monitoring the main amp section, uh, there's definitely some problems going on uh, there when it comes to, again, jittery behavior, the waveforms kind of jumping around, getting a little bit uh, grumpy, and then also, too, the amplitudes are kind of yeah, bouncing back and forth. So there's just instability there. Whereas when I was monitoring the, pre, the preamp out, that was stable all the way through the monitoring. Uh, the symmetry was almost spot on. Uh, you saw that. Uh, you know, the symmetry was, was looking really good between both channels. And um, same thing with the jittery uh, behavior. There wasn't really any to speak of. I didn't notice the waveforms bouncing around. So the preamp part of things seems to be doing okay. Is there uh, some problems with the controls? Yeah, I think so, maybe a little bit. I think, you know, the usual, they're a bit, a bit dirty. They could certainly benefit from being flushed out multiple times, uh, properly relubricated, exercise them really, really, really good, uh, work any kinks out of those. But like I said, I don't believe that that's what's causing our, uh, our issue with the uh, jittery behavior and the, and the asymmetry in this case. I do need the green light to work on the controls because I don't want the controls hindering uh, me moving any further. Because if you have controls that are causing problems, I've said it before, they're going to make it harder to troubleshoot a uh, faulty component that's causing a problem within your amplifier. If you've got um, control troubles, in other words. So you've got to get those out of the way. And like I said, once we get you know, those amp boards refurbished, uh, new electrolytics, get some of those transistors out of there that are known to be problematic now that they're older you know the uh, 726 is the I think I think the 1451s I think I think they're 1451s but anyways uh, the transistors in this unit that are known to uh, act up get leaky get noisy all that or just fail altogether so I am going to check all that very good all the components and spot check them and uh, tolerance check them and everything else but want to get those boards cleaned up and I know at that point especially when I go through and clean up any uh, bad solder joints I'm sure we'll be looking good you know in the main amp, amp section once again provided the outputs are okay everything is is fine there which I'm sure they are uh, we're going to be looking good but we've got to get that power supply done that's really important so to the owner um, I know you may not be anticipating going into this much work, but um, I would recommend that you do if you want to have this thing working reliably for uh, you know years to come. You know you don't want fickle controls. You definitely don't want a fickle power supply. That's your heart. That's the heartbeat of this thing. Bad heart, no heart. You you ain't got nothing. And then the main amp section sections, uh, both boards, both channels. These are areas of the uh, piece of equipment that undergo more electrical wear and tear, your power supply, your amplifier boards, and all that. So, And with the controls, well, it's just about that time, you know, dust, dirt, debris, that kind of stuff that works its way in, degraded lubricants. Um, these controls should be serviced at this point. And if the customer wants me to move forward from here, well, I'll be uh, back on it at some point when I could get it back on the bench get the parts list together and start um, start getting the parts on board. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to end it here, guys. And as I always say, peace, love, music, and the vintage audio that brings it to your ears. Till next time, y'all take care. This is a poor man's shoe production.